play a little word association game. You know how it works. I say a word, and you picture in your mind the very first thing that comes to your mind. Are you ready? Sumo wrestler. You probably thought of something like that. Library. Something like that, maybe. One more. A saint. Maybe something like that. Mother Teresa. What I'm almost a hundred percent sure, though, that didn't come to your mind. Is something like this, a selfie, meaning yourself. But what if I told you that the closest picture that you have of a saint is what you see every morning in the mirror? You'd probably think I was crazy, because, let's be honest, none of us see ourselves is very saintly. But it's true. It's who you are in Christ and who you're meant to be in Christ. You see, last week we started this little two-week sermon series called My True Selfie. And looking at a couple of some of the most amazing things that the Bible says about our true selves. Maybe we've never known or maybe we just haven't really understood. And both of them flow from what a new life in Christ promises us. And here's that promise. That no matter who you are, or what you've done, you can become a new person. A new creation. A new everything. And I love how the Bible puts it in 2 Corinthians, where it says, those who become Christians become new persons. They are not the same anymore, for the old life is gone. A new life has begun. All this newness of life is from God, who brought us back to himself through what Christ did. And last week we talked about one aspect of this that new creation, about how we are now sons and daughters of God. This week, I want to look at how we are also not just sons and daughters, but we are saints. You see, if you're in a relationship with Christ, as your forgiver, as your leader, if you've crossed that line to be in a relationship with Him, you have been declared positionally by God to be a saint. That's how God views you. That's who has, He has declared you to be. That's who you are. It is all throughout the Bible. But I'm going to take a quick trip through just one book. We're just going to look at what it says in one book, the book of Ephesians. We're going to look at how this is clear to us. Paul begins the book of Ephesians by saying, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God to the saints in Ephesus. And then in verse 18 of that same chapter, he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Then in chapter 2, Paul writes, So then you are no longer strangers and sojourners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. In chapter 3, Paul, talking about himself in relation to other Christians, says this, I am the very least of all the saints. Then in chapter 4, in talking about the role of a pastor in the life of a church, he says this, Some should be pastors and teachers, 
to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And then in closing out the letter, notice how Paul reminds them to keep praying for each other. Always keep on praying for all the saints. You see, there was no doubt to Paul that the identity of someone who's now in a relationship with Christ, they are a saint. And God wanted there to be no doubt in mine or yours either. So what is this all about? Because you don't feel like a saint. Neither do I most of the time. So why does God call everyone that's in a relationship with Christ a saint? You see, we have this mindset that saints, you know, they're supposed to be holy. You know, almost perfect people who've committed their entire life to doing the work of God in the spirit of humility under great persecution. That's what we think of when it comes to a saint. And let's be honest, that doesn't really fit most of us. Some of you have may even come from a religious background where saints were figures from history that the church recognized to be venerated, to be lifted up, and even to be prayed to. So what does the Bible mean when it calls someone a saint? Especially what since it calls all Christians saints. You see, the word saint means those who are set apart. Meaning someone who's no longer a part of a world of sin. Someone who no longer has sin staining them. Stenching them, attaching itself to them. The moment that you trust Christ, coming to Him for forgiveness, leadership, the very nature of your spiritual state has been radically altered. No matter who you are, how you've lived, what you've done, you have gone from sinner to saint. Why? Because your sins have been forgiven. God has said you are no longer what you were or who you were. Whatever, whatever you've done, however you've lived, will not be the final word, much less the defining reality of your life. You're declared holy in the eyes of God. Do something for him. Think about that, that one thing. That one incredibly terrible thing that you've done that you don't think you can ever get past. That could ever really be removed from your record. Maybe it wasn't a single event. Maybe it was a season of your life. A period of time where you engaged in a series of activities and events that you would do anything to forget about. Maybe it's a single sin that keeps coming back over and over again. What if you could know? What if you could know and experience absolute forgiveness for what you're thinking about right now? You wiped off the books, wiped out of your memory. To have who you are in God's eyes, never associated with it again. That's the new identity that Christ offers you. That's one of the reasons why baptism is such a beautiful and meaningful part of the Christian life. It symbolizes your passage from one identity to another. In fact, in the early church, they would baptize people buck naked. Talk about scandalous. And quite frankly, it wasn't as much fun as it may sound because men baptized men and women baptized women, so the scandal really wasn't there all that much. 
But when they came up out of the water, they would be clothed at that point in a white robe, symbolizing their new life in Christ as saints. It's an important symbol because that's how God looks at you. As someone he has now declared a saint. And it has nothing to do with who you are or what you do or what you don't do. It's simply a positional declaration made by God when you come to him for forgiveness and relationship through Christ. And God means what he declares. I read of this Christian professor who was teaching a class, a sociology class at the University of Pennsylvania. Being a Christian, he tried to work in a word about Jesus every once in a while. And one day during a conversation about prostitution as a sociological phenomenon, he asked a question. Do you ever ask yourself, what the various leaders of the world throughout history would have said to a prostitute? What about Buddha? What would, the, what would Buddha have said to a prostitute? Nobody in the class knew. What about Muhammad? What would Muhammad have said to a prostitute? Again, nobody knew. And then he said, what about Jesus? What would Jesus have said to a prostitute? And then a student in the front row said this. I don't think he ever met one. And the professor said, well, actually he did. Let me show you where it is in the New Testament where Jesus met a prostitute. And just as he was about to whip the word out on this young guy, the student said, professor, you don't understand what I'm saying. I said Jesus never met a prostitute. And the professor said, oh no, you're wrong. He did, and I'm going to show you in the Bible where he did and what he said to her. Then the student explained, professor, my point is that Jesus never met a prostitute. I mean, when he met Mary Magdalene, do you think he saw her as a prostitute? The professor was stunned with the insight of this student, because he was absolutely right. Jesus never met a prostitute. He didn't look at people that way, the way that we look at them. He didn't judge people the way that we look at them and judge them. What Jesus saw in Mary is what he sees in each of you, a saint. So let's talk about this spiritual tug of war that's going on inside of you. And what I would wager is going on in many of us. You see, there are these two competing voices in your life saying radically different things. And you're going to have to make a choice as to which one you're going to listen to. God wants you to know that you're a saint. But Satan. Satan did not. He wants nothing more than your personal destruction. So he's running an intensely personal PR campaign to get you to think about anything about yourself other than the fact that God has called you to be a saint. And he has two main strategies. And quite frankly, they're both pretty slick. You see, Satan's first strategy is to play along with what God seems to be saying, but in a distorted way. You see, he'll say, you're okay. In fact, you're great. You're not a bad person. Sure, you make mistakes, but you're not, you're not a sinner. In other words, he wants you to think that you're a saint intrinsically of your own doing, through your own goodness, which is not at all what God is saying about you. God is saying that despite your sin, despite the fact that you should be rejected, that you can be forgiven, 
you know, declared a saint through Christ. You see, it's not your saintliness, but His, that is being recognized and applied to you. You didn't earn it. It's a gift. Here's the other way that Satan will try to mess with you on this. He'll tell you, if he can't get you to buy into your inherent goodness, he wants you to be enslaved in your badness. He wants to come up alongside you and say, I can't believe you call yourself a Christian. Look at how you live. Look at what you just did. Look at what you're thinking. You're a pathetic excuse for someone who says that they've come to Christ. Your baptism is a joke. You're no saint. Not even close to one. You're a moral failure. A constant screw up. A colossal, epic failure. And you always will. That's the voice of Satan. He takes your failure and he throws it in your face over and over again. He wants you to be chained to that, bound by it, to have that be the defining mark of your life. But then, but then there's God's voice. And God's voice is different. Instead of accusation, there is conviction when you do wrong. That tinge of good guilt that reminds us that that's not who we were called to be, or how we're called to act, or how we're supposed to live, which drives us to ask for forgiveness, which is what God gives us. You see, we aren't a failure. We're forgiven. And because of that, we aren't chained, we're changed. Instead of being bound to what we have done, we can rise above it, move past it, and become different people. Do you see the difference between these two voices? Let's look at this changed dynamic. You see, there's more to the identity that awaits us than merely being declared a saint by God positionally through forgiveness. He also wants to develop us into saints functionally. You see, when you become a Christian, God has a very clear agenda for your life. It's to make us more like Jesus. To make you more like Jesus than you were a year ago, more like Jesus than you were six months ago, is to take your life and to have you become the person that he has declared you to be. And one of the most remarkable verses in the Bible about this is found in the book of Ezekiel, where it says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. It's as if God is saying, you're a saint. Now live like one. He also says, I'll help. That's my job, is to help. Think of it this way. Imagine that Michael Jordan arguably the greatest basketball player of all time, and now co-owner of the Charlotte Hornets, were to come up to you and say, you're on my team. You're now officially a member of the Charlotte Hornets basketball team. Here's your uniform, your locker, everything. It's official. You are now a Hornet. And he says, don't worry. Your status as a member of the team has nothing to do with your basketball ability. Thank goodness for those of you that have seen me play over here. 
Wow. My back is killing me this morning. It took me 20 minutes to put my shoes on yesterday. And he says it had nothing to do with your basketball ability. I'm just choosing to accept you. To bestow upon you this identity. You're now a Charlotte Hornet. But here's what I want you to do. Now that you're on an NBA team, I want you to let me develop you into a professional level player. I want you to become who I've already made you to be. Now, how is he going to do that? Is he just going to send you out there and tell you to try real hard? Is that what makes professional basketball players professional basketball players? To try hard? Is that how Michael Jordan reached his level of performance? No. Jordan reached that level not because he tried to play that way, but because he trained to play that way. He achieved his winning level of performance through an overall life of preparation and practice. Came through his diet, working with the coaching staff, through the practice schedule. So that when the game time rolled around, and there's an opening to the basket, natural instincts took over. And he did what we all wish we could do, and we wish we could be paid the money that he got to do it. That's the way it works in your spiritual life, too. That's why Jesus once said in the book of Luke, everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher. And then Paul wrote in the book of 1 Corinthians, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the game goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. This new identity that you have in Christ is incredible. You're a saint. And you can live like one, too. As a Christian, you can enter into a life of training and development under the coaching and guidance of God and all the resources that His church can bring to bear and begin developing into the thing that he has already declared you to be. But there's one thing, there's one thing God will bring to bear in your life that Michael Jordan would never have with those that he invested in. And that's the power and presence of God in your life. The mind-blowing nature of the Christian life is that when you come into a relationship with God, God comes into your life. He takes up residence. His power and His presence is there for every step of the way. As you enter into a life of training that He has developed for the Christian life, you will receive His power to do it. He has called you to be a saint. And He will make you into one as well. He wants to begin right where you are, with all of your junk, all of your mistakes, sins, rebellion, confusion. He wants to start right there and bring a new identity into existence. Isn't that what you'd like him to do for you? You see, we feel like we're not saints. Like we're not good enough for that. Wouldn't you like to have your life be defined, to be identified that way? And here's what Christ offers to you and to me. It can be. All we have to do is be willing to come to him for forgiveness and leadership and let him put us on his 
and then begin ordering our lives around the relationships, the experiences, the practices of the Christian life that will change us from the inside out. Which is what all of the resources of this church are about. Whether it's a small group, whether it's the weekend service, everything that we are doing is trying to bring all that we have to bear as a church onto you as a Christian to help you develop into that saint that God has declared us to be. If you will, you have no idea what you could become. Let me tell you a story about just how real this transformation can be. It's about a guy by the name of Billy Moore. You see, Billy grew up in a tough city in Ohio. He and his friends would smoke crack, get drunk, and break into bars. They committed all kinds of crimes. Then one day, Billy tried to get his life straight, joined the army, and got married. But it wasn't long before that old life came back into the picture, and his wife left him and took their child with her. He was broke. He was desperate. One night, he and a friend were drunk and high, and began to talk about how they needed money. And his friend told him about this guy who lived nearby, didn't trust banks, kept all of his money in the bedroom. When Billy found this out, in fact, this wasn't some big, strong guy, but actually just an old man, he said, let's go. Went back to the army barracks, got a gun. Together they drove to this man's house. You see, this 77-year-old man was in bed when Billy kicked open the front door. The old man grabbed a shotgun that he used for hunting. As Billy entered the bedroom, the man pointed the gun and pulled the trigger. The aim was high, sending buckshot over Billy's shoulder. Billy took out his gun, pointed it at the man, and pulled the trigger twice. The elderly gentleman fell dead. He then went through his pockets, ransacked the bedroom, and walked away with a grand total of $5,600. Fled to his trailer in Georgia. It didn't take long for the police to track him down. He was caught with proceeds and admitted his guilt. This is a mugshot from when he was arrested. You see, Billy Moore's mom knew a pastor and wife that lived near the jail. So she called. She said, I've got a son. He's been arrested for murder. Would you please go visit him? And the couple went and told Billy that Jesus was willing to give him a fresh and a new chance at life. And Billy just stared at him. And he said, you've, you've got to be kidding me. You know what I've done? I murdered an old grandfather. My life is over. There are no new beginnings for me. But the couple looked back at Billy and told him, no, you don't understand. Christ loves you so much. He wants to find a way to make even your life count. Billy not only heard those words, but he saw Jesus in them. He would later say that nobody ever told me that Jesus loved me. It was a love I could feel. It was a love that I wanted. It was a love I needed. So Billy Moore, as hopeless and a broken individual as you could ever find, got down on his knees and prayed. God, I'm sorry for all I've done. I want to live for you 
if you would adopt me and take me to heaven, that would be best, but I don't have much time left. But if you could do something to make my life count, it would be icing on the cake. Jesus heard that prayer. You see, there's a bathtub on death row. Permission was granted for the guards to fill it with water. The pastor and his wife who led Billy to Christ came in and dipped him backwards into the water to baptize him. Then God began to change Billy. Instead of mounting a defense, he pled guilty to murder. He actually told the judge, how can I tell you I didn't do it? I'm guilty. He was sentenced to death. But the criminal justice system is slow. It took 16 years before it was his time to die. But during those 16 years, Billy kept opening up his life to God, and God changed him from the inside out. He became a model prisoner. In fact, the guards called him the peacemaker. Death Row to be an ugly, violent, hate-filled place. Till Billy got there. He started having Bible studies with the other inmates. And one by one, they found a new life in Christ, just like Billy did. He even built a relationship with the family of the 77-year-old man who killed. He received their forgiveness as well. August of 1990, the court system finally caught up with Billy. The hours began to tick away down to August 22nd, 1990, when he would be executed. And as that date drew near, he was put in what's called the death watch cell. His lawyers called him, but it was a strange experience to them. One of them would say, we called him to console him, but he ended up consoling us. He said, are you guys okay? I know this is difficult for you. Is that crazy? We were trying to reach out to him, but he was reaching out to us. On August the 21st, 1990, seven and a half hours before Billy Moore was to be electrocuted, something amazing happened. The Georgia Pardon and Parole Board held an emergency hearing about this model prisoner that they've heard from from such spiritual luminaries as Mother Teresa, who had personally lobbied on his behalf. They heard from the family of the victim who went to the parole board and asked that Billy Moore be set free. His head and his right calf had already been shaved to receive the electrodes. But the five members of the pardon and parole board looked at that repentant, transformed man and did something so unprecedented that it made the front page of the New York Times. They looked at Billy Moore and said, we're going to show you mercy. They threw out the death sentence and set the gears in motion to release him from prison. It was the first time in Georgian history that a confessed killer on death row was free. An editorial in a local newspaper said, in the eyes of many, Billy was a saintly figure. And today, you can go to Rome, Georgia, and attend a church where Billy Moore serves as the pastor. And if you're in prison in Georgia, in that area, Billy Moore has probably come to see you talk to you, share this story with you, because every week he goes to the prison and gives Bible studies. You see, when you come to Christ, you're not only adopted as a son or daughter of God, but you are declared to be a saint. Then God will spend the rest of your life changing you into who he has declared you to be. 
All we have to do is to pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, help us to realize that we are saints. We don't have to look at a picture of Mother Teresa to see us saints. We can look in the mirror. We can take a selfie and know that that is a saint that we are looking at. Thank you for what you have done for us. Thank you for inviting us to join your team. Help us to make that choice. Turn our eyes over to you. And to do whatever it is we can do to have that relationship with you. We ask this in Jesus' name.